John, chapter number one. John 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. Father, bless your holy Word tonight now. Anointed in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. John the Apostle has his way of writing. You can, if you study much of the Bible, you'll see that it doesn't write like Matthew, Mark, or Luke. John uh, speaks and perceives from the direction the Holy Ghost gave him. Each one of these Gospels are here for a reason. They complement each other. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called synoptic Gospels. That is an arbitrary, man-made term. In other words, they have one synopsis and one, one view, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John is different. John is different. That's important. The word sent, sent, shows up time and time and time and time and time and time again in the Gospel of John. The Greek word, one of the Greek words translated sent is apostello, apostello. That's where we get our term apostle. An apostle is a sent one. The Lord Jesus is even called the apostle of our faith. He's the sent one. Now when someone is sent, that brings up the issue, where did they come from? Why were they sent, and to who are they ministering? And this is what's happening here in the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. Word was God. God the Father is a spirit being. Therefore, we do not have any idea what he looks like. In the Old Testament, they had what's called theophanies, which was a manifestation of God in different ways. And to get a little more specific, you have what's called Christophanies, manifestation of Christ in different ways. The Lord Jesus Christ was the Word of God living among men. That meant this. That meant that the Lord Jesus Christ was the direct expression of the Almighty to mankind, whether he said anything or not. Remember, he's the Word of God, and he became flesh and dwelt among us. There's something unique about the Lord Jesus Christ that when he gets around a human being, or a human being gets around him, he can relate to that human being like nothing else can because he's called the Son of Man. Being the Son of Man, therefore, he has a connection with us that no angel, no cherubim, no seraphim has. He has a direct connection with us. The only way that connection could come about is by the incarnation. God became a man. When the Lord Jesus Christ gets around someone, he's able to pull out of that individual and put into that individual what nothing else can. The Lord Jesus says all judgment now has been given to the Son. The Father no longer judges. So what's that mean? Well, it means this, basically. It doesn't necessarily mean that Christ is judging people in the sense that he tries you like a court of law. He certainly can do that. Now, don't dismiss that. He certainly can. But the very fact that he's with us or present is a judgment in itself because it has to do with what we're going to do with him. What will we do with Christ? What are we going to do with him? You see, every man on the face of this earth is going to have to give an account for what he did with him. What are you going to do with this man? The Lord Jesus. Pilate said, what would you have me to do with Jesus, which is called Christ? They screamed back, crucify him. Therefore, the Lord Jesus Christ is the manifest word of God. The Gospel of John begins on that theme that the word of God is going to be manifest in this book in a way that it's not in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The Gospel of John is all about the deity of the Son of God. His humanity is not uh, mentioned near as much as his deity. He's God. He's God in flesh. John chapter number 9, Dost thou believe in the Son of God, who is the Lord that I might believe? I that speak to thee am he. And so the blind man, blind from his mother's womb that was healed when he went to the pool of Siloam, said, I believe. And he believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord Jesus Christ said plainly, he's God. Now what he says to you is the word directly spoken to you. But who he is to you is the word of God manifest to you. Imagine God Almighty, the eternal being, living where he lives. And he really needs no place to live because he's an eternal spirit being. We can't wrap our mind around that. 
We have to relate to beginnings and endings. We have to relate to God in a way that we can understand him. And so this is why God incarnated himself. He became a man. But the Bible says plainly, God's not a man like us. But he incarnated himself as a man. In other words, if you say the hand of God, you're talking about the hand of Christ. If you say the eyes of the Lord, you're talking about the eyes of Christ. For the Lord Jesus Christ is all we've ever known about God or ever will know about him until the Son of God makes the Father real to us. And that's another word that shows up in the Gospel of John over and over and over again, and that's the word Father. The Gospel of John, therefore, presents our relationship to God as our Father. And the reason for this is because God's Son has made it possible for us to relate to God as our Father. If God is our Father, that means that we have a special relationship with God that nothing else really has. Do you love your children? Do your children have access to you? Do your children have a special place in your heart? Would you die for your children? Would you help your children? Would you give to your children what they need? Certainly you would. You wouldn't elevate your car over your daughter. You wouldn't young. You wouldn't do it. You wouldn't, you wouldn't elevate a golf game over a grandson. And of course, that's not even needful to say. Bottom line is that the child relationship is a very important thing. John chapter number 3, 1 John 3, the epistles of John is what they're called. 1 John 3, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we might be called sons of God. Right? That's what he said. He said, it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know when we see him, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. John the Apostle knew, he knew, that Christ was the manifestation of God to mankind as far as we could possibly comprehend and receive him. And so he starts out the Gospel of John, this is the word. The first miracle that's performed at the Gospel of John, and it tells you plainly what it is, Water is turned to wine. Now there are three trees in the Bible that relate directly to Israel and has to do with specific things. One is the olive tree, another is the fig tree, and the other is the vine. The vine gives forth juice, therefore it represents spiritual realities because that spiritual reality is all through John. The fig tree gives forth figs. Lord Jesus came expecting fruit, no fruit, and he cursed it, and he said, this kingdom will be taken from you and given to one bearing fruit. And, of course, it was taken from the Jew. The olive tree, you know, in the book of Genesis was the tree of life. That's a powerful uh, type because the tree of life is in the millennium, and it's in eternity, and it's by the river of the water of life. And in the book of, John, in the book of Romans, chapter number 11, we Gentiles have been grafted in to the tree of life, all right? The tree of life, therefore, represents the religious privileges of Israel, the vine, their spiritual privileges, the fig tree, their national privileges. And if you notice now what I'm saying to you, everything in that Bible revolves around what God's doing with the Jewish people. Where are we today? Well, to compare ourselves to Israel. And where did the Messiah come from? He came from Israel. Where did the Word of God come from? It came from Israel. It came from the Jews. And so therefore, we have a great debt to them. So when we come into the Gospel of John, the first miracle that's performed has to do with the spiritual privileges of Israel. It's water turned into wine. And note carefully, when he turns this water into wine, the, what do they call him, the master of the feast or whatever it was, said to him, he said, this is very unusual. Very unusual. Usually, you know, uh, you, get, you, get the, uh, you get the good wine first and then the, and then the uh, bad after you're drunk. <laughs> I mean, that's really what he was saying. After you're, you know, after you're drunk, then you get the bad stuff. He said, but you didn't do that. And here's why. When the Lord Jesus Christ came into this world, he came with the truth. And he came offering a spiritual kingdom to Israel. He offered them the spiritual superiority and priority over everything. And they rejected him. And so what happens? Watch it as it weaves itself through the gospel of John. 
and it eventually comes to the Gentiles. Look at John 9, pool, as I mentioned to you a moment ago, man born blind. He goes to a pool, Siloam. The writer of John, which is John, tells you what that word means. He, he, he translates it for you. He said it means sent, the sent one. Now it's important because when John the Baptist shows up in the Gospel of John, the Bible says of John the Baptist, and he's the forerunner, he said there was a man sent from God, and his name was John, right? In a sense, John the Baptist was an apostle because he's an ascent one. Now don't get confused. You say that to some people. Oh, Preacher Lawson said John the, John the Baptist was an apostle. He was a sent one, and you look up the word, and it is apostello. He's sent from God. Remember, if he's sent from God, his commission comes from God. His power and authority come from God. It's not related to humanity. He doesn't check in with anybody to see if it's okay to preach what he preaches. John the Baptist was unique just like Elijah. That's why his counterpart is given. If you'll remember John the Baptist in the book of Matthew, I think it was, the Lord Jesus says, Elijah hath truly come, if you'll receive him. And he was talking about John the Baptist. John showed up as the forerunner of Christ. He was sent from God. Now in John chapter number 20, the Lord Jesus, after his resurrection, appeared to the disciples while they were in a room, and he breathed on them, and he said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. He said, As the Father hath sent me, even so send I you. The commission as apostles. And in order for them to have any authority, they needed the unction and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And we do today. Nothing has changed. Without the unction of the Holy Spirit of God, it's called dead works. It may be dead good works, but it's still dead works. The only way that fruit can be produced through the life of a Christian is found in John chapter 15. In the Gospel of John chapter number 15, we get back into the spiritual part of the Gospel of John. Remember, the first miracle that he performed was turning water to wine. Now in John chapter number 15, he said, I am the true vine. I'm the true vine. If you know anything about a vine, you can read over there in the book of Ezekiel, and I talked about this a little earlier, two or three weeks ago. Ezekiel says plainly, the vine is good for nothing except to produce fruit. You can't build houses with it. The wood is good for nothing. It's, 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 the only purpose in a vine is to bring forth fruit. So that makes you think about a Christian. You're really the only reason you're here is to bring forth fruit. Well, see, preacher, how do I produce fruit? If you're trying to, that's self-righteousness. You can't produce fruit. It must be done in you from a greater source. In other words, it must come forth from the vine because you're the branch. They say that 2,000 years ago, it wasn't unusual, when they went in and they, they purged and cleaned, uh, cleansed all of the vines and the vineyards and all of that, that they would wind up with a pile of cuttings. And that pile of cuttings, they would just burn because they're good for nothing. They're not good for anything. So they just burned them. And you remember in John 15, the Lord told his disciples, he says, now, he said, if you don't bring forth fruit, he said, you'll be purged, you'll be cut off, and you'll be burned. A lot of folks think he's talking about them going to hell, but I don't think that's the case necessarily. I think a lot of times Christians can get uh, cold, backslidden, uh, full of themselves and what have you. And uh, he, he may have to uh, take you to the woodshed. The woodshed's, okay. the woodshed's better than a lot of other choices. <laughs> Believe me. <laughs> You're better off when he takes you to the woodshed. And, uh, and you know something? How many of you have ever been chastened and you knew it was a chastisement and you knew God do it was doing it because of chastisement and when it was done you said, thank you, I still love you, God, glory to God. I'm glad I know you're mine and I'm, and you're mine and I'm yours and you've proved it to me and in, the, in the, and in the secrecy and the quietness of your own soul, <laughs> you talk to God and he's proven your sonship. And there's nothing greater than that. There's nothing greater than to know that you're a son of God by the new birth. You see, Israel's called my sons and daughters as a national sense. Uh, and the, the angels, he said, the sons of God shouted for joy when God created uh, the, uh, the physical universe. 
Well, they're sons of God in that sense in the Old Testament, but not like we are. We are sons of God by the new birth. That means we've been born of God. That means there's something in us of God. There means something from God. So he gave them, he gave them an unction and anointing in John chapter number 20. Now let me tell you something. The Bible in many places, not just one or two, but in a number of places in the scripture, the meaning is not necessarily easy to get. And that's one. That's one of them. Where he says... Uh, Whosoever sins you remit, they shall be remitted. Whosoever sins you retain, they shall be retained. I send you forth with the same unction and anointing that I have. Because he said, as I have received from the Father, I give to you. As he was sent from the Father, he sends us. Yes, he does. As we receive what he gives to us. And we say to that tonight, well, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a strong thing. Yes, it is. But remember... Remember this, it's very important. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, remember he's the word, you will bring forth much fruit. Abiding in Christ means to walk in fellowship and be communion with him and be where you should be with him. You remember what I told you the last time, I was last Wednesday night or whenever it was, about the blood of Christ? You remember what I told you about that? It's important. Because I've had people even talk to me since then and they've said, Preacher, that, that helped me. That made a big difference in my, in my prayer life. And what I told you was this. I said, you cannot expect for God to answer your prayers because you're a good Christian. Don't expect Him to answer your prayers because you're sincere. Don't expect Him to answer your prayers because you're an independent, fundamental, Baptist, King James only. Well, how do I know He'll answer my prayers? When you expect that blood that was shed, that is alive at this moment, that is speaking of the death of Christ, and of the efficacy. In other words, he's able to do above and beyond all that you ask or think. In plainer words, you come to him in blood. You come to him in living blood. You come to him in blood that's sprinkled upon the altar. You say, well, man, that's a, that's a kind of a gruesome thing, isn't it, preacher? Crucifixion's gruesome. Crucifixion's one of the most horrible things that ever happens to anybody on this earth. Did you know that the, the Romans weren't the only ones that crucified people? When they went into Japan uh, just a few centuries ago, they saw people nailed up, crucified. They've been crucified in Africa. They're crucified in, 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 in Russia, in Eastern Europe, all over the world, crucified. It's nothing unusual to take somebody and nail them up. That's a horrible death. It's a long, protracted death. But the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified. Why? Because he was cursed. Cursed is everyone that hangeth upon a tree. He was cursed for us. And he shed his blood. And that blood that he shed is the very vehicle that gets you into the presence of God. No blood, no presence to God. No blood, no answer to your prayer. No blood, no new birth. No blood, no faith. No blood, no salvation. So if you try to circumvent the blood, you're going to get in big time trouble. I'll tell you what happens. Once you, once, you, once you push the blood aside and say you don't need the blood, then you're left to your own self-righteousness. And that's one of the worst things that can happen to you. That's one of the worst things that you can have is self-righteousness. So be done with it and say, Lord Jesus, I love you. I love you. I love you with all of my heart and all of my soul. And I believe that when you shed your pre precious blood, that that blood is still alive. It's alive right now in heaven. And it covers the mercy seat. And therefore the mercy seat is happy, satisfied. And now God has looked upon us and in, he was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. And so therefore he's given all judgment to the Son. Now when I say judgment to the Son, I mean this. I mean that if the Lord Jesus Christ shows up in your life, he doesn't have to say a word to you. He is the word. And if you don't accept him, if you don't accept him and you don't believe on him, then the word has spoken to you and condemned you because you have refused to believe in the only begotten Son of God. Are you following me now? He doesn't have to say a word to you. It's just His presence. That's judgment. That's judgment. That means that you have an opportunity to pass from death unto life. And He'll show you what you're made out of. There's nobody that can open up your soul and display you 
<laughs> fillet you like God. How many's ever had him do that to you? Have you ever come in before the Lord and talked to him and your memory has forgotten some things, but the Holy Ghost begins to move in your heart and remind you of a few things you need to confess? And you confess them. So the Gospel of John is a wonderful book when you just simply trace the theme of the word and then the theme of the wine and the spiritual privileges. And it starts with John the Baptist, a man sent from God, and it goes to the apostles. I send you forth with the same commission that I have received from the Father. The Lord Jesus says to them, I can't say a word except what the Father gives me to say. See? The Word was made flesh. If I speak, it's what the Father gives me to say. How much more could the Father say to us tonight? A whole lot more. The Lord Jesus said to his disciples, He said, many more things to say unto you, but you can't bear them yet. You're not ready for it. Not yet. And you know, that's, that's quite a thing. And I'm, you know, the truth of the matter is, by doing that, the Lord has some nice surprises for us. You'll be surprised who is in heaven and who ain't in heaven. <laughs> the Bible says the memory of the wicked shall rot. So it means very well that the time will come when you will not be able to remember certain parts of your life. Brothers or sisters or mothers and fathers who, who rejected the Lord. You will not be pining eternity away in heaven thinking about a loved one in hell. That's not going to happen. Heaven could not be heaven. If that be the case. And that's a sad thing. That's a sad thing. Now. When the Lord Jesus came into this world. All right. The word was with God. And the word was God. When? In the beginning. That means that God the Father. God the Son. And God the Holy Ghost. Have always existed. Throughout eternity. There never was a beginning with them. That means that the word. Has been forever. Let's take it a step further. The spoken word and the written word and then the person of the word are three different things, but they complement each other. This is the written word. Okay, that's the written word of God. It records the spoken word of God. But it also records the living word of God, the one who lived. Right. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all connected with his word. As it goes forth. If his word therefore. Is for man. You and for me. And has always existed through eternity past. When did you come into the mind of God? Did he all of a sudden think of you? You see that's not an easy question to answer. Is it? But it shows you the profoundness that God has for his people. So profound. So profound. Now I want to show you one thing tonight. And I want you to turn to the book of Matthew. Chapter 21 and verse 33. Matthew 21. 33. This is called a parable. Here another parable. What's a parable? A parable is a simple way of saying things that people can relate to in their everyday life that has a far deeper meaning. There's much more going on. Here another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard. Here we are. We're back to the vine now. Spiritual privileges, remember? And hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandmen took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first and they did unto them likewise. Now on the surface of it, what you're reading is he sent his prophets. He warned them. He said, you have a privilege. He said, you are a chosen people and all of that. And yet they stoned them. They killed them. 
But he's expecting spiritual return from these people. He's expecting that. Now look how it continues. Verse 36. Again sent he other servants more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. This shows you the long suffering of God, doesn't it? Shows you how gracious he is. Now look at verse 37. But last of all, he did what? Sent. All right. He sent unto them his son, saying, they will reverence my son. Well, who is he talking about here? He's talking about the Lord Jesus. He said, surely they'll reverence my son, did they? But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, now look at this carefully. What does it say in the Bible? This is the heir. Does that mean they knew who he was? That's exactly what it meant. Now, a lot of people out there that scream, crucify, 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 you know, just the average man in the street didn't have a clue. But these people did. These people did. That makes their damnation even greater. See, that's the point. Even greater. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and let us seize on his inheritance. That's arrogance on their part. Okay. They caught him, cast him out of the vineyard, slew him. When the Lord there of the vineyard cometh, what will he do to these husbandmen? They say unto him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Make any difference, receive him or reject him. God's going to build his kingdom. It's going to get done. So in John chapter number 2, the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. Why does it third day? Why would it say third day? When you go through the Bible, you'll find the number 7 is a number of divine completion. Because you can't get better than 7. So the gematria, the name of the Lord Jesus, is 888. New beginning, new beginning, new beginning. But in the Bible, when you find the number 7, you'll find it, and this is important, you'll find it laid out 4 and 3, 4 and 3, 4 and 3. Okay? 4 and 3. How many thousands of years had passed when the Lord showed up 2,000 years ago? How many? Four. How many thousands of years have passed since he was here 2,000 years ago? <laughs> Who's buried in Grant's tomb? <laughs> 2,000, right? So what do we got here then? We have a millennium, right? And that is the third. See, this is what he's talking about here. Four and three. This is the third day. This is moving into the millennium. You see, he's doing something here that for the time being, they didn't understand what he was talking about. But what he's saying to these people is that something's going to change, and it's going to change drastically from what it used to be. Now, look at chapter number 9 of Matthew in verse 17. Matthew 9, 17. Matthew 9, 17. We're still talking about wine. And folks, I'm just scratching around with wine. Oh, there's a whole lot more in here. But this, I'm just pulling it in with what I'm talking about tonight. It's only a small part. But look at 9.17, Matthew. Neither do men put new wine into old bottles, else the bottles break and the wine runneth out and the bottles perish. But they put new wine into new bottles, and both are preserved. All right, on the surface of it, if you and those people 2,000 years ago had no problem with this. Making wine was as common with these people as pressing olive oil. It was part of their culture, part of their life. And they understood what he was saying because you don't put new wine in old bottles. Now when you get a little deeper into it, you realize he's saying to them, you had the old covenant and the old way. He said, but there's a new way, a new and living way. And that new and living way is me. Christ said of himself, it's me. So therefore, I'm not going to take the old wine of the Old Testament and just rework it. 
and make it sound better. There's going to be a completely new system. And of course, the wine and his blood are synonymous, right? He said, this is the blood of the New Testament. So now he's telling these people something drastic is about to change. And I think some of them got a hold of it. They, they understood it. They really did. Nicodemus says, we know thou art a man sent from God, for no man can do the things thou doest except God be with him. The Lord didn't sit down and talk about Zechariah and Ezekiel and Daniel and all that and Hosea. What did he say? Nicodemus, you must be born again. That's what he said to him. This new wine you find showing up in John 3. That's new wine. See? That's not old wine. That's not, they, if they'd, listen, if they had had plenty of wine, then it would have been old wine that they were serving the people. But they ran out of it, remember? They ran completely out of that wine, so he gave them new wine. See this? They don't, I doubt if, they, if a one of them there understood what was going on, but the Lord Jesus did. And so did John when he wrote it down. Because he said, this is the beginning of miracles. This is the first one. Why would he number them? Why would he say, this is the first miracle, this is the second miracle, this is the third one? He did that because every single one of them are leading up to something. And the wine is very important. Spiritual privileges, therefore. Do you go to Israel for spiritual authority? No. Where do you go? You go to this book, illuminated by the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Spirit will feed you spiritual truths from the Bible. Now, I appreciate Israel. I appreciate the Bible they gave me. Because that Old Testament is Jewish from bone to bone. But I don't turn to a rabbi. I don't turn to any Jewish authority for spiritual truth. Where do I go? I go to the Bible. On my knees and pray. And seek the face of God. That's the new wine. And that new wine will hold because it's in a new bottle. And I thank me unto God for it. Now, I'll close with this. Remember, the, 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 uh, the fig tree represents Israel's national authority. The olive tree represents Israel's religious authority. Okay, they were the head of the nations. He said, I'm going to make you the head of the nations. The day's going to come. When people come to Jerusalem, they won't be coming to London, New York. They're going to Jerusalem. All right? These are all merged in one. The vine tree, the fig tree, and the olive tree will be sitting right there in Jerusalem. All three combined in that millennial reign of Christ. It's going to be there, sure as you live. But if you go home and read Romans chapter number 11, if you'll read Romans 11, read it and pray over what you're reading. Read it carefully. Ask God to give you light in it. Forget I ever said a word about it. Just say, Lord, what's going on here in Romans chapter number 11? And remember this now. Romans 11 is not talking about a vine. And it's not talking about figs. What's it talking about? Olive tree. The olive tree. And they were cut off. You've been grafted in. Boast not yourself because you can be cut off and the natural branches grafted in. Right, anybody follow me tonight? That's some strong stuff. If you believe in eternal security, stay out of Romans 11. I believe in eternal security. Like I say, there are passages in the Bible. Let me tell you what I've learned and I'll shut up. I'm having a hard time shutting up tonight, but let me tell you what I've learned. I've learned, here's what I've learned. I've learned that if you go to a Nazarene church or a Methodist church or a Catholic church or a Baptist church or a Presbyterian church, you're going to get into a church that's governed by a catechism. What's a catechism? A catechism has to do with we believe this, we believe that, we believe this, we believe that, we believe this, we don't believe this, we don't believe that, we don't believe this, but we believe this, we believe that, we believe this, we believe that. And 99% of all the preaching and teaching goes right down the line with the catechism. That's what you're going to get. They're going to stick right to it because they don't want to confuse you. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, just before I send you home, there are passages in the Bible that will blow your mind. That's why I love it. That's the Word of God. How many of you believe tonight that God's mind cannot be picked?
Now you can pick mine, no big deal. But God's mind, you're not going to pick his mind. You're not going to pick his brain. The only thing you'll ever know is what he reveals to you. So right now, where is Israel's spiritual privileges? They have none. You've got it in your hand right there. Got it in your hand. Remember this. Hath God cast away his people which he foreknew? God forbid. Amen. Father, bless your word. little time we've had together here tonight. Study it. The time we have to come together with my brothers and my sisters in fellowship, Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name.